We're ready. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jelani Cobb, and I'm the director of the IRA Lipman Center uh, at Columbia University, Columbia Journalism School. Uh, thank you for coming out this evening or joining us virtually uh, this evening. Uh, we are delighted to have for our current installment of the Lipman Dialogues, uh, a discussion of a really groundbreaking and significant book, uh, which is written uh, by none other than our own uh, esteemed faculty member, Howard French. Uh, and it is this book here to make sure I'm holding it up. Uh, Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans and the Making of the Modern World. 1471 to the Second World War. And uh, I spoke with Professor French uh, when they first uh, came out and just said this was a really gorgeous uh, book cover, uh, which I thought was uh, befitting the significance of the book uh, and all the work that went into it. Uh, so how are you doing uh, tonight, Howard? Everything's good. It's wonderful to be with you, Jelani, and with the virtual audience. We had hoped, we had dreamed at one point that this would be in person, but the COVID gods denied us. Yeah, so. they, they are mercurial, uh, as, as I understand it. Um, so, oh, and I should also have given uh, Professor French's bio for one second. I'll read that to you. Howard French is the author of four works of nonfiction, including most recently Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World. Uh, 1471 to the Second World War, uh, which was selected as one of the best books of the year by the Financial Times. His previous book, Everything Under the Heavens, How the Past Helped Sh Helps Shape China's Push for Global Power, was named a notable book of the year by the New York Times and The Guardian. He's also the author of China's Second Continent, How a Million Migrants Are Building a New Empire in Africa, and that came out in 2014, and A Continent for the Taking, the Tragedy and Hope of Africa, uh, which was in 2004, both of which were also named among the best books of the year after publication. Uh, he has produced documentary photography uh, shown and collected on four continents and the book of photography titled Disappearing Shanghai, Photographs and Poems of an Intimate Way of Life. Uh, and since 2008, he has been a professor at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, Prior to that, for over two decades, he was a senior writer and foreign correspondent for the New York Times, uh, working in the Caribbean and Central America, West and Central Africa, Japan, uh, the Koreas, and China. Uh, and so I think we can just start, you know, I think it's good to have you know, that bio uh, at the front of our minds because it allows us to kind of think about uh, where you've been and you know what you've seen, what you've observed. And so I think I'll just start with the most basic question, which is uh, how did this project come about? Thank you. Um, the, 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 the professional bio is a piece of it. I, I guess I would, I, would, um, I would highlight three things. One of them is sort of family history and personal biography. Um, uh, one of the um, many narratives in this book centers on on a family story about uh, an, uh, ancestors uh, from the time of Thomas Jefferson, uh, whose um, uh, story is very similar to one of the most famous stories that attaches to Thomas Jefferson's history, and, and, and in many ways, a, 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 um, an ugly story of of, of um, uh, a someone from the family fan, founding fathers' generation and slave owner parenting a child by a woman he owned. Um, and so um, this ancestor of mine, James Barber, who was the governor of Virginia in that era, um, uh, um, uh, much like Thomas Jefferson, uh, begat um, a daughter who is my ancestor. Um, and I grew up with this story in my household. And in fact, my family still owns land that comes down through us, uh, to us through that um, African-American family line. Uh, and so this question of slavery and what it means and how it came about and its, its cosmic significance in the world and, um, and all of that has kind of been front of mind throughout my adulthood. Um, I guess the second piece um, it comes back to the personal, I'm sorry, the professional biography that you just read, and that is that I've worked most, uh, you know, I've, my career can be divided into two phases. The first phase is very much the Atlantic world. And this book is centered on the Atlantic world. I'm, I'm from the United States, obviously. I have um, uh, my ancestry in the American South. 
Um, I speak uh, several European languages and have worked a bit in Europe, but especially I've worked in Africa for two different periods in my professional career in West and Central Africa. So fronting the Atlantic and in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean, all fronting the Caribbean Sea. And so um, I've spent the last, I don't know, 30 years traveling in the world of this book uh, and gathering impressions and asking myself questions and encountering history and having conversations with um, uh, scholars uh, and with survivors and with um, thinkers um, about this shared legacy that we all have uh, in uh, the institution of enslavement. Uh, and I say we all have this shared legacy because the, the legacy of slavery is a legacy of white people as much as it is of bl black people, albeit in very different ways. Uh, white people um, uh, uh, were beneficiaries of the fruits of slavery, of course, um, but that doesn't mean they were not, um, uh, that it's not their shared legacy. And that uh, the final piece um, uh, I would highlight is um, my East Asian experience. Um, I spent the last 10 plus years of my career at the New York Times in um, succession working in Japan and then China. And in those two parts of the world, <clears throat> this question of how the West, so to speak, had ascended and had um, uh, distanced itself in terms of wealth and power from other civilizational centers is, is, is very much a contemporary conversation. People talk about this all the time and it's debated. And um, you know, there are protagonists for different philosophical and historical arguments about how this came about and what it means, what it says about Westerners and Westernism and what it says about Asian-ness, et cetera, et cetera. And so my last book, um, Everything Under the Heavens, is really a book of, of about how China um, uh, processes its own history as a power vis-a-vis uh, -vis this kind of question. And in the research of that book, I came across things that astounded me that were sort of off the beaten path of that book, but which had to do with the Portuguese explorations of the 15th and 16th century. Um, you know, we have this very standard tale about the start of modernity that I think pretty much everyone in America and Europe learns at one point, which says that the modern age begins with Christopher Columbus, quote unquote, discovering the Americas. Uh, and that this came about as a result of, uh, of a European obsession with finding a maritime route to Asia. And to the extent that Africa is mentioned at all uh, in, in that equation, Africa appears as, a, as a, an obstacle to be circumnavigated. Uh, and in the research for that previous book, I came across quite by accident, um, fortuitous accident as it was, but quite by accident, um, contemporary accounts from the 15th century of Portuguese nat mariners uh, who actually, uh, I discovered, did not initially set out with an obsession to discover a route to Asia, but in fact um, had a primary objective of establishing trade ties with West Africa, which they had reason to believe, and we can get into the details for this so that this answer isn't too long, but so which they had reason to believe as early as the early 1400s in, in Iberia, in Southern Europe, West Africa was the richest part of the world, the center of global wealth. And so this just, you know, I, I, I didn't interrupt the previous book that I was working on. I finished that project, but this just, you know, ar arrested me uh, um, in, in other ways and sat with me. And I just knew from that moment, having discovered these texts, uh, that I had to do something with this. And so that constitutes one of the foundations of this book. Hmm. So also I should say, um, uh, before I go further, that we will have, uh, for people who are watching, we will have time for uh, questions from you. And about 6.40 or so, uh, we will uh, turn to questions from the audience. Uh, if you want to, uh, to bring a question or to ask a question, uh, you can use the Q&A function uh, and uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, and before we go, so I, so I think what's fascinating about this, and there are a couple of the like kind of foundational questions that I want to to ask um, before we get into uh, the kind of historical journey that you took with this project, uh, which is one of the first conversations that that you and I had here um, was about the coverage of Africa and how Africa is covered. Uh, and it's a comment you've, you've made previously, uh, you know, uh, and, and so 
Uh, I thought about that as a, almost a consequence or maybe a parallel uh, to the dynamic of history. You know, as you, you frame Africa as the, you know a place to be circumnavigated, can you talk a little bit about this? You know, what your observations were uh, as a person who was a correspondent in West Africa, and how the coverage, the ways that people tend to cover matters on the African continent, uh, is related to these dynamics you're talking about? Sure. Um, I, how Africa is treated conventionally in terms of history and in terms of the scholarly resources we invest in history. Um, is very similar to how Africa is treated in our journalism. And both of them um, uh, involve um, something that I'll call, for lack of a better word, uh, a process of erasure or trivialization. Uh, and these processes um, uh, um, result in uh, the reduction of the place of Africa in our narratives to the smallest possible uh, degree. Um, and so in African, in jour Western journalism of Africa, Africa is reduced Africa is, is covered in ways that um, sort of are limited to um, uh, instances of um, uh, spectacular violence or um, incredible, so prior, um, this would hold true prior to COVID. Now COVID is, uh, is, has hit the West worse than any other part of the world, but, but the outbreak of, 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 of horrible diseases or um, uh, coup d'etats and political violence, uh, things like that. And in between those sorts of events, Africa just would sort of recede and dis disappear from the coverage. There was no, um, there was no sense, there has never been a sense um, in Western media that there is any ongoing obligation to treat Africa as one would treat any other part of the world, let's say Western Europe or um, much of the Middle East or East Asia or um, the Soviet Union and subsequently Russia um, as places as as places where there was society and culture and politics in an, of, of an ongoing nature, not you know the spectacular sort of um, um, uh, discontinuities of coup d'etats and, and and civil wars and things like that, but that politics is an ongoing process and that outsiders should want to know about what are the politics of Nigeria and what are the politics of South Africa as opposed to you know, um, uh, the sort of more punctual tra tragedy-based uh, orientation that I described. Um, and so, um, as I've already indicated, this is how we've treated history as well. Everybody knows that um, Africa was the source of uh, the human beings who um, uh, were um, trafficked in the transatlantic slave trade, right? Um, but if you ask uh, people even who have had reasonably good educations, and consider themselves well read, anything about Africa between, say, 1492 and 1900, they probably can't tell you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because um, you, you can be considered well educated in the West without having the obligation to encounter any history of Africa. I'll take that one step further. Um, the position of many of the most famous Western scholars and even recent politicians, Western scholars across the ages, um, I'm talking about people like Hegel, uh, mm -hmm. for, for the most, uh, to take the most famous example, was that Africa is a place outside of time. Right. That, that there is no history in Africa. Uh, and this tr trope gets repeated over and over uh, to the point where a recent French president, a man named Nicolas Sarkozy, even said mm -hmm. something like this, you know, less than a decade ago. Um, and so I don't want to belabor the point, but but you you have this, you know, the way journalism history work are, are I think on most subjects are closely related. You know, mm -hmm. there's the, this cliche that journalism is the first draft of history, and and to the extent that's true, you would expect to see how journalism treats a particular geographic area or cultural space is going to be similar to the way history, similar in many ways to the way history will treat that uh, same space. You know, it's interesting because in looking at this and the way that uh, people have tended to talk about Africa as an undifferentiated mass, you know, um, as, a continent, as a continent reduced to a country, uh, on those two ideas being interchangeable uh, and it being so, uh, you know, representative uh, of these broader dynamics that you talk about in this book. And when you first mentioned this to me, uh, you know, I ran into you outside the building 
and said, oh, what's your new book about? And you said, I'm writing Africa back into history. Uh, and I thought that's a monumental task. It, but then, you know, the other, next thing I thought about is that it's a, an ongoing task. You know, Du Bois uh, wrote The World in Africa in the, the 1940s, uh, talking about the centrality of Africa and the way in which Africa was uh, a dynamic uh, factor in world affairs uh, to the neglect uh, and the uh, erasure, to use your term, uh, that we've seen in so many different instances. And so I, I want to think, you know, for our conversation in three places, you know, on the African continent, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, and in uh, the Southern United States South. And so uh, if we could just start about, you know, you spend a good amount of time tracing through um, the Portuguese relationship in particular, but the European relationship with Africa as it relates to one mineral and that being gold. Uh, and will you, can you just summarize a little bit about uh, the way that gold uh, motivated and appeared, uh, became a central theme in the thinking of Europeans uh, mm -hmm. around this, the onset, the out, around the outset of this period. Sure, before I do so, I'd like to just jump back very quickly to touch upon Du Bois and uh, your previous question about erasure and to say that I believe, and I think if he, we were able to have a conversation with him, Du Bois would also agree that the erasure of Africa and Africans from the narrative of humanity and of progress and of um, uh, sort of dynamic history is not just uh, what I've previously described it as having been, but it, there's something more insidious involved here. And that is that it's part, it has, in terms of our education and in terms of our um, popular culture, it's also, it has also been about keeping uh, people of African descent as highly balkanized as possible. Mm -hmm. because the potential in their unity and the potential in their pursuit of connections between themselves has been seen as threatening. Mm -hmm. um, and so this has meant, historically speaking, keeping African-Americans as ignorant uh, as of Africa as possible, quite apart from general American ignorance of mm -hmm. Africa, mm -hmm. and, and perpetuating a kind of taint I don't, I think fortunately this has faded in the last generation to some degree, but perpetuating, perpetuating a kind of taint about Africa among African-Americans and mm -hmm. also among Africans toward uh, African-Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was one of the major purposes of writing this book is to help reveal the ways that when you get beneath the surface of our kind of um, uh, chauvinist particularities, how much we share how many, how strong the foundations of shared ex, shared experience and of shared history are so so the question of gold um let me say that um in the 14th century can I, can I add to that really quickly though sure. yeah. I, I think that's a really important point because it's not just ignorance it's a certain kind of jubilant ignorance yes uh, an ignorance that's revelatory other people revel in uh you know just this week, uh, Joe Rogan made some comment about uh, darkest Africa where people don't wear clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, who, uh, future president of the United States, who was at that time the governor of California, said to the then president of the United States uh, of African diplomats uh, who were visiting the United States that they weren't accustomed to wearing shoes. Yep. Uh, but these ideas, you know, are not unconnected. <laughs> to the material exploitation of the continent that we've seen, you know, and, and the tragic devastating consequences uh, that four centuries of expropriation of wealth and human beings have had. Uh, and so it's just a kind of astounding thing when you think about it, especially kind of reading this book and kind of going through uh, the kind of nuggets and details and, you know, the, the slave trading wars in the Congo uh, that you mentioned that have sparked at the behest uh, of their European trade partners and then become a contagion uh, you know, leading to, uh, to death uh, you know, on, on a grand scale throughout the, the region. Uh, I, I wonder if I could just for one second ask you what it was like grappling with the immensity of those ideas while you were working on this project. Well, this was a, 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 a terribly difficult challenge for me. Um, I, I felt that I, on the one hand, I had to tell this whole story, the whole story of the last 600 years in terms of this experience. 
Uh, and that means starting at the beginning and not where we think it, we most of us think it began, which is goes back to your question about gold. We all think it began with Africa af actually having in fact been an obstacle that the Europeans were just trying to get around. When in fact, this all begin, this story begins at, at least a century prior with Europeans being hell bent on connecting to Africa because in fact, Africa represented a very powerfully positive value for them. Um, uh, but um, so I just felt I had to, I had to, there was just such an enormity of things that I had to include in this book, um, partly because they, the, the details as, as numerous as they are really do hang together in terms of argument. Uh, it, it's of a whole cloth, so to speak, but also because, um, uh, you know, there's so little attention given to this stuff. And I didn't know, you know, you can't assume you're going to get a second crack at something. And so I just said, I've got to, as, as much as it is, I've got to wrestle it to the ground and I've got to get it all in there. Right. Um, and, and, and so the challenge is people don't, to be very candid with you, people don't like big books anymore. Uh, this is a 500 plus page book. Um, almost any publisher will tell you, uh, try to keep it to 300 pages or less. You know, the, can, the, can you can you make it a tweet if possible? <laughs> exactly. You know, you'll scare the readers away and stuff like that. And so I had to I successfully fought that kind of direction off uh, and had to cling to the importance of the long narrative and to the, um, you know, exhaustive documentation and footnoting and to, you know, respect for detail. Um, but at the same time, draw as much as I could. It's not a book of journalism, really, but draw as much as I could on my experience of narrative writing as a journalist to make sure that it, it, it had some kind of propulsion, enough propulsion to it to, to keep people engaged. It's not a book written for historians. Historians, are, of course, are welcome to read it, and have, the response has been pretty good from historians, but I want everyone to read this book. And so so you can see the tension between those challenges of wanting everything to be in there, so to speak, and things to be, you know, very solidly documented. I've experienced no takedowns, by the way, which mm -hmm. shocks me. Nobody has come at me with a kind of um, a violent, ugly, or or Joe Rogan kind of ignorance um, uh, trying to take me down. Um, uh, and I think that's because of the strength of the documentation. But to do all of that on the one hand, to keep it sort of readable and approachable on the other hand, despite being 500 pages, that, that was really the challenge. Mm -hmm. So I interrupted the previous conversation about the, the centrality of gold in, the, in this conversation. Yeah, so uh, very quickly, I'm gonna condense this um, uh, to be efficient. In 1324, an African emperor named Mansa Musa set off over land uh, from Mali, the empire, empire of Mali, uh, with a grand convoy of people on camelback carrying 18 tons of gold. Uh, and he was on his way to pilgrimage to Mecca, but he stopped in Cairo. Um, uh, and he distributed, no one has ever before or since seen any individual in possession of anything remotely like 18 tons of gold. And he distributed so much of the gold along the way uh, in patronage and, and other acts of generosity that the price of gold plummeted in the Mediterranean world for over a decade. Um, and so um, this creates um, a kind of uh, legend. I mean, these are factual events. There's no doubt about it. No one contests that this happened. There are contemporaneous accounts from Egypt, uh, uh, which was under the Mamluk dynasty at the time about all of this. So th this is indisputable, but a sort of legend begins to propagate about the great Mansa Musa and it spreads into Europe. And so right around that time, it's sort of in the later 1300s, Portugal is an infant kingdom. It had just broken off from proto Spain uh, and the Spanish coveted reconquering the Portuguese lands and Portugal was extremely poor. Uh, and Portugal had only um, essentially dried fish and salt as economic products. And so the Portuguese came up with this idea of connecting, trying to discover the source of this Malian gold uh, and establishing trade with Mali as a kind of moonshot. This was their long uh, odds attempt to get onto their feet as a kingdom and to become as prosperous as, as, as they could in order to withstand the sort of aggression by Spain. Um, this becomes a decades long pursuit. And this is 
why the 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 erasure of of Africa in this narrative of being sort of a, simply an obstacle to be circumnavigated is so outrageous because the Portuguese effort to discover the source of this gold um, unfolded over a period of decades um, from the early 1400s until the year 1471, which appears in the title of my book, when they finally arrived uh, at uh, the site uh, called El Mina in present day Ghana. And there was so much gold in, of, in circulation in El Mina that even apparently poor people had gold. And mm -hmm. so the Portuguese knew that, you know, they had hit, uh, the, this was their Eureka, right? They, they had hit the, the mother load. And so they begin to establish um, a very prosperous trade in gold. So prosperous, by the way, that 25% of Portuguese crown uh, income for the next 30 years came from trade with that one place alone. This was the richest source of gold in the known world to Europe. Um, and this single-handedly made Portugal a viable kingdom. Uh, and um, so Portugal gets onto its feet, so to speak, as a prosperous kingdom. The wealth that it obtains in trade with Ghana uh, um, or with Elmina um, begins to create very rich trade circuits that for the first time integrate North and Southern Europe which had very little commerce between them prior to that. Um, and um, uh, Portuguese, Portugal begins to build fleets. Uh, the most famous navigators of, of this time are going back and forth to El Mina. Christopher Columbus himself, 20 years before he went to the Americas. Vasco da Gama, the guy who supposedly discovers the route to India. Bartolomeu Diaz, the man who went around uh, the Cape of Good Hope and enters the, the Indian Ocean, the first time a European had ever done that. All of these people and many of the other big navigators of that era are employed ferrying gold and supplies back and forth between trade goods between uh, uh, Portugal and, and Ghana. Uh, and so this, I argue, is the beginning of the modern era. It is not uh, Columbus is uh, setting foot in the Bahamas in, in 1493, but rather um, uh, this Portuguese connection via trade with, with uh, the part of West Africa we call Ghana now. Mm -hmm. So, so um, we have this as a kind of foundational thing and the, the dynamics that it sets into motion uh, over the course of ensuing decades uh, and, uh, and centuries. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about the second uh, locale which is moving ahead in time in, in the book, uh, and that being Haiti. Uh, and if you could talk a little bit about the significance of Haiti and Haitians in uh, these affairs. And also, uh, last point at the outset, that um, I was remiss in not thanking our partners uh, for this, African Journalists Association and, and, and NABJ. Uh, we're happy to have them on board um, with us for this conversation uh, as well. Um, so can you talk a little bit about Haiti uh, sure. and uh, how that plays a role and even the, the cameo uh, from George Washington in 1791, which was you know, a really stunning detail to include there? Sure. Um, I would, uh, first of all, like to join you in thanking the two student associations. It was so important to me that they should both be able to participate in this. And mm -hmm. so I can't see all of you, but I'm delighted that this came off this way. Um, before we get to Haiti, I have to mention something else. And that is on another island in another hemisphere off the coast of West Africa um, at a place called Sao Tome. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years after the Portuguese discover uh, gold in Ghana, they discovered the island of Sao Tome. And I think this is one of the most important historical events of the last 500 years. Uh, and I'll explain why. It is on Sao Tome, which was uninhabited, uh, a, a, an island that's a small island that's right on the equator. Volcanic, rich soils, um, uh, strong seasonal rainfall that the Portuguese uh, planted sugar cane which they had been experimenting with in the northern parts of the Atlantic prior to that. And it turns out that Sao Tome is as good a place to grow sugar as anywhere in the world. And so the Portuguese begin to bring enslaved people from the African continent to grow sugar on Sao Tome. It is this event that I believe was the most important economic event uh, in the modern world prior to the start of the industrial of, of industrialization, and I'll tell you why. Um, 
the comp so I'm going to call it an innovation um, because it was a new business model. We all I don't need to persuade you. In fact, I, I'll, 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 I'll I will persuade you of the horror attached to this. But innovation is the right word. The Portuguese came to understand how to grow sugar using slave labor, organized in a very um, uh, sort of proto-industrial way on, on Sao Tome that becomes immensely influential and immensely wealth producing in subsequent decades and centuries. So much so that on the island of Barbados, so I'm talking in Sao Tome mm -hmm. where, where uh, sugar production uh, using slaves on plantations, I should say that plantation I, I think of and uh, say in the book I, is, is a euphemism. Uh, mm -hmm. We should always give pause when we speak in haste about plantations and try to reflect more deeply about what we're talking about. We're talking about industrial prison labor camps mm -hmm. on which uh, human beings were forced to produce commodities on a racial basis for other human beings uh, at uh, the at um, you know at, at the lash. Um, and worked to death, literally worked to death. Um, this is the site where chattel slavery is invented, and this is the site where this prettified thing called the plantation is invented. Uh, and this happens in the early years of the 1500s in Sao Tome. By accident of history, right around that same time, Portugal discovers what we subs subsequently came to know as Brazil. And this plantation organization innovation or technology transits the Atlantic and goes to Brazil. Uh, and given the fact that the Brazil is at the exact same latitude as Sao Tome and is vast, um, uh, there's this explosion of plantation agriculture growing sugar in this era. Sugar is was prior to this an extremely expensive right. luxury good. Right. The richest people in European courts could afford to have. It most was, most people never tasted it in their life. In their whole lives. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, so it is in Brazil, given the extent of land available for this and the sudden sort of increase in the supply of slaves across the Atlantic, that the production of sugar becomes um, uh, sort of rises in volume such that European diets uh, are completely changed. They're completely transformed. By it. <clears throat> and, and we can get into some of the political and cultural um, uh, um, uh, results of all of that if we have time to. Anyway, the most important, so in the standard narrative, the most important economic event of that age doesn't involve Portugal at all. Mm -hmm. The stories we learn in high school and in sort of introductory college history classes about this age are most famously are about the Spanish um, conquering, you know, conquistadors, defeating native uh, kingdoms mm -hmm. in places like Bolivia and Peru and Mexico mm -hmm. and the like, and filling up boats called galleons with gold and silver. And, and ferrying these enormous riches in precious metals across the Atlantic or to China for trade with silk and things like that. Uh, and so this is the story of new world wealth that we're told. Uh, and in, these, in, the, in the 1500s and 1600s, the economic impact uh, of slavery is again, um, just sort of written out. The fact is that between uh, 16, 1580 and 1630, um, which is precisely the peak of the gold trade, I'm sorry, of the silver trade for Spain and South America, Brazil, via slave labor, the labor of enslaved people, produced more wealth by far for Portugal than Spain got from filling its galleons with gold and silver. And so in, I'm coming to Haiti. In 1630, um, England gets into the game and, Colin, and, and and takes possession of Barbados in the Caribbean, which had been an uninhabited island at the time, and brings copies the Portuguese techniques and brings slaves to that island to grow sugar. Over the next 50 years in Barbados, Barbados is one third the size in terms of land mass of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. bringing hundreds of thousands of human beings who were worked to death in the space of five to seven years on average. Um, England, made more money in Barbados, one third the size of Los Angeles, than, Port than Spain made from all of the famous gold and silver that it carried, carted off across the Atlantic in its galleons. And so this produces a 
there's a migration. Everybody is copying each other among European imperial powers as they jump into this game and employ Africans to pursue this manna through commodity production with sugar leading the way until we finally get to Haiti. And Haiti, the French are sort of um, uh, late in scaling up, but they finally begin to do so in around the year 1730 on Haiti, which was a divided island called Hispaniola, but they, the French controlled you know, a, a, a big portion of it, the Spanish controlled the other portion of it. And in a very brief period of time under French control of Haiti, Haiti becomes the richest colony ever known to mankind. Mm -hmm. That is that, that, that astounding, never to be surpassed. Mm -hmm. um, and that is simply by scaling up the importation of African labor to produce sugar. Two, uh, it's two thirds of, of French uh, revenue in, in those years leading up to the revolution, uh, two thirds of their revenue come from a single place. Two thirds of their foreign trade. Yeah, yeah two thirds of their foreign trade uh, comes mm -hmm. to a single place and that's Haiti. Right, and so it was Africans, and this is, this is back to your original question. We, you know, there were no such thing as Haitians yet, in fact. So the French called this colony Saint-Domingue uh, and the people who were working the plantations in this colony were Africans because if you arrive as an adult and your typical life longevity is seven years, you don't have time to be acculturated or to become transformed into some other, you know, identity. You, you possess the identity you came with, whether you were from Benin or from Yoruba or from Congo or from Ghana or from what other place. The French, like other Europeans, deliberately brought people from different places so that they would have trouble communicating with each other and working in concert with each other to, to resist. In Haiti, nonetheless, despite all of that, the Africans rose up in 1791, and they successively defeated the three greatest empires of the age, the Spanish, the British, and the French. And the French threw so much into trying to put down the rebellion of uh, Africans in Haiti that uh, Napoleon, who was the emperor at the time, nearly drove his country bankrupt. And so in order to avoid bankruptcy, Napoleon was forced to sell what would become part, all or part of 15 American states centered in the Midwest to the Thomas Jefferson administration. And it is this sale of the um, Missis, I'm sorry, of the Louisiana Purchase as this uh, territory was known to the United States, which for the first time gives the United States truly continental pretensions as a power. For the first time, you could imagine the United States being a great power, a continental power uh, that had, you know, a, a control over enormous territories well beyond uh, the, the 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 Blue Ridge Mountains or the Alleghenies and and, and stuff like that, right? Um, something else really important. Well, two other things that I want to mention happen. So we think of uh, the Enlightenment as being the product of white people because that's how white people speak of the enlightenment. It was their ideas and their actions and their grace that produced th these wonderful advancements in terms of um, uh, human society. It is in Haiti with the Haitian revolution that the most fundamental value of the enlightenment was realized on this globe for the first time. And that value was an, an end to slavery, and legal equality for all people, regardless of their race, color, or background. That had never happened anywhere in the world before, never mind uh, in the places that we typically associate with the Enlightenment. And the Haitians um, integrated such ideas into their very constitution as they um, uh, uh, defeated the French and established their new republic. One final thing. So um, white people in the United States see and elsewhere, seeing the victory of the Africans in Haiti are panicked. And their response was to try to quarantine, to isolate Haiti, to punish Haiti, to blockade Haiti, to, to avoid or to outlaw trade with Haiti and not to recognize Haiti politically. There was another kind of response in the United States, specifically in the slaveholding American South. Suddenly there was this sort of live panic that if Africans can do this in Haiti, well, maybe they will do this here too. Given a chance, they'll do this too. It's just a matter of time that they will rise up 
and take over or destroy the, the plantation economy of the South and kill a bunch of people, right? Um, and so um, this helps unleash the second great migration of Africans on, on main, on the, uh, in, in the Americas, meaning uh, after the transatlantic trade, after having arrived from Africa, now there's this impulsion to lighten the population of Africans in the, the old South, so to speak, the places like Virginia, where my ancestors come from, or Georgia or South Carolina, places like that, and to send them westward. And, and as, as this happened, uh, it came to be understood how much profit could be made from growing another, a new crop, uh, right. that crop being cotton in the Mississippi Valley. And so in a remarkably short period of time, from the 1790s into the first decades of the 1800s, cotton becomes, by a very large distance, the most important export of the United States. It becomes the economic motor of the United States. Now, some people will argue against this. So say, if you look at the numbers of cotton trade, you can't say that this is alone uh, merits being called the economic motor of the United States. But you can't look at the cotton. First of all, the cotton numbers by production and by value are extraordinary. And I list them in my book. But that's not the end of the story. Cotton has all of these other secondary effects in terms of trade, in terms of transport, in terms of finance, in terms of insurance, in terms of uh, the, Tex the, the textiles of the Northeast. Tex textiles. So first of all, in terms of textiles, it is the sine qua non ingredient of the Industrial Revolution. There's mm -hmm. no Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. without American cotton grown by Africans, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so all of these things are sort of downstream effects of the Haitian Revolution. So we've, we've touched on, you know, these three places we wanted to get to, and we, this conversation is just zipping by. Um, I want to be true to my word and say that we will get to some questions. Uh, and so uh, I will start with one, this, uh, this person is anonymous. I have a question about whether Pre Professor French thinks about uh, how contemporary Africa is covered compared to when he was reporting on the continent. Uh, has the narrative about the continent become more sophisticated, reflective of, of the complexity of what's happening there? Uh, if not, uh, why? Why not? Uh, and if yes, what's changed? Um, I think some important things have happened, but I think we still have a long ways to go. I mean, the import most important thing to happen that I would mention is that Africans have become, uh, for the first time in, in significant ways, integrated sort of in the front line of coverage uh, of Africa in the mainstream American media. Um, uh, we have two students of the former students of the J School who now are um, correspondents for the New York Times in Africa. One of them uh, is in uh, Nairobi and the other is in South Africa. Um, that just didn't exist before. Um, and, and that's a welcome development and an important development. But I still uh, would say that Africa is um, suffers from a relative lack of attention and investment in terms of um, American news coverage. I mean, the New York Times is not the whole of the American news industry. I, I would even say the New York Times needs to do better uh, still. However, you've, there's one phenomenon that, that I, I think is, I should point out to you that, uh, that is quite irksome uh, and distinguishes African coverage to, um, for, the, for, the, for the publications that have representatives in Africa against other parts of the world. I'm not going to embarrass anyone or name news organizations or, 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 or correspondents, but there are a lot of people at sort of leading Western news organizations whose type of coverage of Africa consists of almost never traveling, of sitting uh, in a bureau somewhere, uh, let's say in Dakar or Nairobi, and writing kind of... Um, round up stories about events that are happening in other countries hundred, hundreds of miles away. And usually um, uh, uh, the voices that one finds in these stories consist of people who work for, uh, are dominated by people who work for Western organizations of one kind or another, be they Western diplomats, Western NGO people or Western academics. And the voices of Africans themselves are, are 
are, are few and far between. Uh, and so by virtue of not really, so this is the news organizations themselves not willing to pay for enough travel uh, and um, people settling for a representation of Africa that doesn't require, I don't think you can go, I've worked in China. Um, I don't think you can go and work in China as a correspondent and not interview Chinese people all the time, that they should be the mainstay of what you're reporting on. That's why you're in China. But you find a kind of Western coverage of Africa where it is still thought legitimate to go cover, speak to people who work for Western organizations and have them explain to you what's going on. And so, so there's, there's a lot of ground that still needs to be made up here. Um, there's another question which uh, says, this is such an important subject. It should be essential reading for all journalists. How many years of research and reporting did it take to put together such a holistic, thorough book? I spent about 10 years reading with this book, uh, the idea of this book in mind amid other, many other kinds of reading and, 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 and lots of other work. And then prior to the actual writing of the book, I spent two years of devoted, dedicated, full-time reading on this in which I, I was a real library rat and, and you know, just plunged deeply into the archives. And in, for one of those years had uh, a wonderful assistant who, research assistant who, uh, who is from Brazil and who I can read Portuguese, but she's Brazilian and it's her native language. And it just, it, it you know, since uh, the first third of the book anyway, it really has a lot to do with B Portugal's um, pioneering role in many things with regard to the early modern age, both the gold story I told you and with the start of the slave trade, it was important to get the kind of Portuguese record. And 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 so, yeah, two, two years of just full time uh, working as in terms of reading and research on the book, and then probably another two years writing the book. Mm. Uh, I have another question, one of, of my own, which is that um, there's a cliche you mentioned about journalism being the first draft of history, but there's been some fairly notable uh, history written by journalists. And, uh, you know, one of the kind of examples you talk about with off the top of your head is, you know, Barbara Tuckman, uh, The Guns of August, and, you know, people know her as a historian, they don't know she spent many years as a journalist uh, before turning to writing history exclusively, uh, or uh, William Shirer's uh, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, uh, which, People assume uh, that he was a historian. He was a historian because he wrote the, the history, but uh, they don't know that he actually uh, came to this from the perspective of a journalist. So what was different uh, in, in approaching a historical narrative of the sort that you did? And to what extent uh, was your journalism background an asset, you know, and, and what, what was really, I guess, similar to reporting? Well, the first thing that's different is that I'm, so most of the events that I am writing about in this book are separated from us in time by, you know, hundreds of years. Um, and so by definition, there's no living people, even no living memory uh, uh, around to kind of canvas uh, for, for this. And so you end up reading uh, primary and secondary documents um, and trying to come to your own understanding of things on that basis. And this has its own imperfections and limitations. And one of the most important ones is uh, for a topic like mine, the fact that um, uh, the, the record such as it exists is dominated by European sources. Um, uh, and so the, you know, the 15th century record of what the Portuguese was doing, were doing in Africa is almost entirely written by Portuguese people. Now this, uh, there's a there's a, 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 a incredibly interesting and valuable exception to this, which I came to sort of uh, explore and 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 love and and put forward in my book, and that is the 16th uh, century Congo Kingdom uh, uh, and its relations with with Portugal. Congo uh, was a very very sophisticated kingdom even at the time of Portugal's the arrival of the Portuguese in the early 1500s. Uh, and by a couple of coincidences, one of them is in their native religion, the cross, prior to the arrival of Europeans, the cross was an, uh, was an object of worship. It was included in their, in their own uh, notions of cosmology. Um, uh, and so when the Europeans, when the Portuguese showed up with crosses, they thought, 
you know, this has some, you know, very deep significance. And they, this opened the door in their minds to contemplating Christianity in ways that didn't happen so readily in other parts of Africa. And eventually, not eventually, pretty quickly, the Congolese convert to Christianity. Uh, and in doing so, the Congolese adopted as their court language, the Portuguese language. And so the Congolese, um, uh, the, the Congolese elite mastered Portuguese almost instantly, it's very remarkable, and left voluminous documents and correspondence between the, Portuguese, the Congolese kings and sovereigns and the sovereigns of Europe about all sorts of affairs of the day. Um, and so, so, so we, we have those records, which is kind of very special in terms of telling the story. Uh, in, as, a, as, a, as a writing history about this part of the world in the time period that I'm talking about, you don't have so much of that, right? Um, uh, the, in terms of the advantages, I would say, as coming to this from journalism, um, you know, I read a lot of academic historian because that's that's the you know that's the most obvious way to learn about these topics. Um, but people who come up through the academy uh, predominantly aren't aren't necessarily great storytellers, and I hope I'm not offending anybody uh, by saying this. Some of them are truly great storytellers. Some of them- but, Well, it's penalized, it's, it's not encouraged. Actually. Exactly, yeah. I mean, some of them, honestly, candidly, no false humil humility, are much better storytellers than I'll ever be, right? But mm -hmm. most of them are not. And it's because what you just said, that there's no value placed on that in terms mm -hmm. of the credentialing and rituals of academic mm -hmm. scholarship in, in, in that area or in most other areas outside of journalism, right? And so, so I come from a tradition where you've got to keep the reader engaged, all right? And you, you know, this is as true with an 800 word story as it is of an eight, of a 5,000 word story. You know, there's a horror in our, um, in, in our tradition of any kind of dead spot or lull in a story in which you're just, you know, people are going to drop the drop, you know, I was going to say page, nobody reads pages anymore, like physical pages, right? But they're, they're just going to drop it, right? Um, and so, so I leave, leave it to readers to judge how successful I was, but I was mindful of that the whole time in the writing. And I think that my, whatever skill I could bring to this storytelling aspect of things was informed, informed by my journalism. Mm. Uh, I think we have time to sneak in one last question, um, which is an interesting one uh, from Judah Grunstein um, says, hi, Howard, uh, do you see your book in dialogue with the 1619 Project at all? And if so, how? Uh, and how do you explain that your book did not receive the same kind of reception? Um, I'm, I guess by same kind of reception, it means that people have not do not seem to have been driven absolutely insane <laughs> by your book. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so, the I, first of all, I don't see my book in conflict or competition with the 1619 project. Um, uh, I the 1619 project. Um, came out in, uh, in in its original form in the magazine of the New York Times at a time when I was well into my book already. Um, and so I, I was in no way informed. But, you know, my, my plan was set well before I knew anything about the 1619 Project. Um, just to speak about the nature of the two projects, 1619 Project is, especially if one limits oneself to what was originally published in the magazine, is an American story. It's not really the story about the Atlantic world or about the modern age or about um, the impact of slavery writ large or about how European civilization was changed by this institution of slavery or its contact with Africa or how Africa was changed by its contact with Europe and by the institution of slavery. So all of those are really, really sort of fundamental parts of my book that are not part of the, the original 1619 story. Um, and that's not a criticism of the 1619 story. You, there's a scope of work that goes into any kind of project like this, whether it's a long form magazine piece or series of pieces or in a book. And so we came by accident of timing, both of us uh, to a, a, a related topical area um, uh, from different directions, but with some degree, some degree of overlap. In terms of the reception, there's two ways of looking at that. For for one, you know, I'm I'm not afraid. If people want to come at me with a hatchet now, I, I'd be willing to sort of face, you know, enter the lion's den with them. But I haven't experienced that really uh, very much at all. 
right? And uh, there's been very little of the vitriol or polemic that, that has attacked the 1619 project, mostly terribly unjustly, right? Um, uh, and that's, I, I don't know, how, what should I say about that? Great, uh, it's nice, you know, it's been nice not to have had um, gratuitous insults and attacks or to be the tar target of them. The 1619 project, you could sort of the attention can be looked at in a positive way too. I mean, my book's doing well. It's been very well reviewed where it's been reviewed. It's selling well and all the rest. I don't think it'll ever sell as much as the 1619 book will sell. But that's in part because, well, I mean, there's one obvious reason and then there's one more debatable reason. The 1619 project grows out of an institution called the New York Times. Uh, you know, the New York Times has a lot of might and a lot of weight and the big voice. Uh, and, and those things help if you're in the business of trying to get a message out there or eventually to sell a book. My book is the book of an individual. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't begrudge them their audience. And, you know, I'm happy with the way that my book has sort of entered the world and, 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 and is being discussed and, and, is, and is being read. Um, I guess the the final thing that I would say is that um, you know um, my book has the word Africa and Africans, which is the title. Um, uh, you know, so a variant of Africa twice in the title. Africa is a word that scares people away. I really mean that. Americans are not trained in any way in their normal experience of life to be interested in Africa and quite often to be actively disinterested in Africa. And I put the words Africa and Africans very deliberately, consciously, and I'm living with it happily in the title of my book because that needs to change, right? Um, and so there's that. Finally, I will say my book's being translated into a slew of languages. It's being translated already into Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Dutch, German, uh, Brazilian Portuguese, believe it or not, Chinese. Uh, there will be a French edition soon. It hasn't been signed yet, but it's in the, un, in the works. And so, you know, there's going to be a global audience for this book. And this is a global book. This The people who per perpetrated uh, the systems that I am describing in this book need to be confronted with, this arg with the, its arguments as well. Just today, a member of the Spanish royal family said something about Spain needed to be feel proud of itself for the model of colonization that it uh, imposed uh, on the so-called new world uh, and that there was nothing to be ashamed of there. Well, um, I can't wait until my book is out in Spanish and to get a chance to speak in Spain about the book and to take on that 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 interpretation of of uh, the Spanish history in, in in this part of the world. Um, well, on that note, we will uh, look forward to that dialogue as well. Um, and so, you know, here's the book again. Um, that uh, great looking cover. Uh, and this really exemplary job of, of this multi-century spanning uh, narrative that you've created. Uh, so thank you for coming out to, tonight. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us, uh, Professor French. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience uh, who is here with us. Uh, and uh, thank you again to the African Journalists Association and the uh, NABJ. Uh, you all have a good night. Uh, stay safe and stay warm. Thank you very much, Jelani. And and uh, it feels strange to hear you say thank you all for coming out. But but I know, uh, right? Close enough. Thank I, you all I, for I, logging I, on. I get know, the spirit. For sitting down, whatever the term is, <laughs> right. like whatever, whatever. It is thank you, you for did, being with us. Right. Whatever you did to get here. Thank you <laughs> right. for being with us. <laughs> right. I've enjoyed it. Thanks, Jelani. All right. Take care. All right.